So today I'm going to talk to you about how we approached Agile Qual at AOL and some of the benefits that we gained from letting go a little bit of our control over the research process. I'll do that in just a second. <laughs> Which way do I need to point? Did I do that or did you miss it? I really have a love-hate relationship with these kinds of devices, so sorry about that. It wasn't turned on. Okay, so first let me tell you a little bit about what drove this change for us at AOL. Uh, a new R&D team at AOL, and by the way, r and is not really centralized at AOL since AOL does so many different things. We have a lot of different R&D teams. A new R&D team came to us with a backlog of about 200 product ideas that they wanted us to get uh, consumer feedback for them on. Um, so initially they wanted some help prioritizing those ideas, and then eventually they told us they'd actually want to do some additional in-depth interviews on some of the ideas that perhaps showed the most promise so that they could do some further vetting and validation to get some further information before they decided to put some ideas into development. Now again, I want to be clear, consumer input isn't the only way that the team was making decisions about how to move ideas through the different stage gates. They had a lot of other things that they were doing, but consumer input was actually a pretty big part of their lean product <coughs> development process. So again, they came to us, they asked for our help with this, and one of the things they really wanted to do was frankly just mitigate risk. I mean, they're like all of us. They don't have enough resources to be able to build out all of the ideas in their pipeline, even if they wanted to, and even if all of them were fantastic ideas, which frankly not all of them were, so that also helped with the prioritization process. And so really, we were doing this to help them basically make some educated bets on which of the things they should be moving into de development and which of the things they should be assigning development resources for. So this request uh, really presented a few different challenges for us. For one, just the sheer number of requests. We'd never gotten this many requests at one time before. Also, the unique nature of the requests. So again, this was pretty different from what a lot of our other stakeholders in AOL asked us for. You know, we work with brands like AOL.com, obviously, but Huffington Post, Engadget, which Rick was nice enough to share if you guys didn't know that Engadget was an AOL brand. So clearly AOL's got a lot of more mature brands in its portfolio. They have more mature audiences. In the case of AOL.com, you can take that pretty literally. But again, the type of research that we do for those stakeholders was very different than this. This was just a different beast altogether and as a consequence, we didn't have just a standard process to be able to you know, railroad these ideas through. Of course, it wouldn't be a fire drill if they hadn't come to us and said that they needed this all really quickly and perhaps more quickly than was possible. And then finally, the last part that was really difficult about this is that we couldn't just throw money or time at it. We weren't actually able to get any additional budget or headcount partly because of where this happened in the year, partly because this wasn't on our roadmap at the beginning of the year. So we basically needed to address this with just the team that we had and just the things, uh, research tools that we'd already paid for. Okay, so we're not really any strangers to working really hard to getting a request out when you're researchers, that kind of comes with the territory. But what we realized is that even if we had worked a lot of Saturdays, and even if we had worked around the clock, all the people on the research team, we weren't going to be able to actually get in front of this because this team had told us that new ideas were coming. We were starting with a backlog, but more things were going to be coming our way. So really what we realized we needed to do was address two different objectives. Now, the short term one was that we needed to fulfill this immediate request. We needed to find a way to prioritize those 200 ideas, and we needed to figure out how we were going to then address all of the qual that came after that. Longer term, what we realized is that we needed a better, sustainable, repeatable process. So again, we could get ahead of this and be much more strategic in our approach versus very reactionary, which is what we had to be at least at the beginning. What, that, what we realized about all of that was that something had to give, and that something was us. We needed to let go of a little bit. Now, I'm starting to hear you know, the Capital One presentation. It's, you guys have gone through this as well. It's something that, as researchers, we tended to like being the research hero. When we were working on a project for our clients, we were doing it at 110%. We were involved in every step of the way. Even when we hired external vendors, our internal research team was that involved, from design, from execution to delivery. 
So this was something that was really scary for us to think about. And again, thinking about it in terms of what was this going to make us look like in the organization if we started to let go some of our control? Would we be seen the same way internally? Would people perhaps resent that we weren't doing as much work as we used to? I was also worried just from the sheer standpoint that culturally, this is something that our team, you know, this is no disrespect that researchers tend to be control freaks. And, and I mean that very, very much as a compliment. My team was no exception. They're perfectionists. So for them to be able to step away and let go of control, well, that was something that was really going to need to change in our culture and in the way we approach things in order to, you know, make a go of letting go. But of course, as often the case, uh, in life and in research, uh, things didn't really need to be that black and white. And what we realized is that we needed to just get more comfortable with letting some of our control over the research process go, while still being pretty comfortable overall with what we were doing. So here's what we did. So remember that first step was that we had all of these uh, backlog of ideas that we needed to prioritize. And there was no way we were going to do that without doing some quick quantitative research. So our approach here was actually to build a template. Remember, we didn't have any of this in, in place. So we built a template, and it was based on uh, the idea that we wanted to score all of these ideas in a consistent way. And it included three basic questions. One of those is we were looking for uh, behaviors. So had people done specific target behaviors recently? And we had different behaviors for all of the ideas that we were testing. The second one was the importance of the, uh, call it, job to be done that was driving the behavior. So say, for example, the behavior we were looking for is had people recently tried to install a new technology or a new device? Well, then the job to be done was installing that new technology or, job, uh, uh, technology or device. And so again, we were asking how important that was. Didn't matter just that they were doing it, but was it something that was actually important to them? And then the last question we were using was painfulness. So how painful was it for you to install that new technology or device? Now at this point, after we had created the template, we turned the entire thing over to our internal stakeholders. And we made them come up with all of the behaviors and all of the jobs to be done that were gonna be the inputs for our testing. We didn't do any custom research at this point. And when they came to us and asked us to, we actually told them no. Um, obviously that made things easier for us to be able to get through this backlog and run the tests. And clearly we were able to sell it to our client by just telling them that this would help us get comparability between waves as we ran all of these uh, ideas. So once we got the inputs back from the R&D team, we started running all of these ideas through our AOL omnibus. Uh, so again, that was really important because the omnibus is something that we fund at the beginning of the year. Uh, so it was no new money for us to use this tool. And I say uh, AOL Omnibus, but it's not just among AOL users. We actually buy third-party sample and we run it every week. So we're getting 1,000 GenPop consumers. And so we started running about 10 or 15 ideas at a time through our Omnibus to get these scores, put everything through there. Um, and then we got some initial information to help us make these decisions. So the team would look at this and basically it's, it's crossing the sort of a, a proxy for market size by basically how big a deal this is to consumers. Um, as you might guess, things that were in green would typically go on to the next phase of development or research. Things that were in red would either have to be pivoted, perhaps turned into a new idea, or those would just be killed. So we felt pretty proud of ourselves that we had gotten this done really quickly and we were able to put in place this prioritization process. We ended up eventually feeling like this was a misstep. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, just really quickly, the R&D team felt that they, hey, they had been spending way too much time on problems and crafting problem statements and not really a lot of time thinking about solutions. It caused a different issue for them down the road, so that was one thing that was a learning for them. On our side, we started to see that we had been approaching this whole idea of talking to consumers about their needs in a pretty negative standpoint of consumer technology, talking to them just about painfulness didn't seem like the best way to uh, go about uh, looking for inspiration for innovation. So you might wonder why I'm telling you that we messed up and embarrassing myself in the process um, that we did mess up. But the reason is that this is actually one of our learnings for the Agile Qual process, and that is that mistakes are actually part of the process. This was something that, again, when we started to give up some of this control, it was something that was really difficult at first for us to come to grips with, but let's be clear, it's okay that you mess up when you're doing this kind of thing. The whole point of it is to iterate and make changes, and as long as you're looking 
for continuous opportunities for improvement and learning as you go, then you're not in fact missing the point of the process. So really, we actually learned that what we were doing was pretty similar to what the teams were doing. Our stakeholders were using an experimental approach to do their design for their products, and that's actually what we were doing on the research side. Now again, remember, we're research heroes, and so it was really difficult for us to admit up front that we uh, didn't know exactly how we were going to get there or that we didn't have all of the answers up front. But we needed to be really clear with our stakeholders about the fact that we were working with them, figuring it out, that we were, in fact, going to stumble a couple times. Uh, as it was, though, it was really helpful that we were so honest. I think that it helped them actually be more comfortable with the process overall, and it probably bought us the luxury of a few uh, mulligans, especially early in the process. Now, we weren't done experimenting with our approach yet because we had gotten through the prioritization and we got enough information that we felt pretty good about moving forward. But now we had identified a few dozen ideas that we needed to move into the next stage of qualitative research. And as you can imagine, if we were freaked out about having to do 200 ideas quantitatively, we were really worried about having to do a few dozen ideas qualitatively. Qualitative research just takes more time. It is more time intensive. It takes more elapsed time to talk to the number of people that we need to talk to, and then it takes a lot more time to make it through all of that analysis. So we realized, again, something had to give, and we really needed to become more agile. When you look up agility, this really fun thing happens, which is a lot of images come up for dog agility. So that's the only reason that's there. I have a Bichon, and he's like 20 years old. I'm not exaggerating about that. So his jumping over fences days are long past, but I just thought that was really cute. But really, <laughs> focus on the other part of the slide, which is the definition of agility. So it's the power of moving quickly and easily. It's the ability to think and draw conclusions quickly. But we needed to do that for our call game. We needed to develop quality. That's the power to do quality search quickly and easily, and more importantly, the ability to synthesize qual data to reach conclusions quickly and easily. So for us and for this project, that meant a couple things. One, it meant repurposing a tool that we were already using and that we had already paid for to be able to do these qual interviews. And then two, it meant we needed to develop a new process to turn over to our stakeholders to basically redistribute some of the most time-intensive tasks that were involved in qualitative research. So remember at this point, we've gone through, we've prioritized, we now have a few dozen ideas that we want to uh, explore with consumers. We used a, a qualitative research method uh, called a problem interview, or in some cases we use solution interviews. And we were doing these remotely using a self-service platform that we had already had uh, in our budget and already had on deck. And it was usertesting.com. Now I don't know if we've got any folks in the audience who are user testing com people or user testing users. Um, it is what it sounds like. It's a tool that's designed to do remote usability testing. And we use it that way. That's why we were using it for a lot of our other stakeholders. But we realized that it's also a way that we could pretty quickly and easily uh, target an audience for qual research, get them into interviews quickly, and then get feedback, qualitative feedback from them, again, quickly, easily, no new budget. So remember, at the beginning of the process, uh, we realized that what we needed to do was get this tool in place. Well, now we have to figure out what the process is going to be. So we leaned on our client once again. Uh, first, what we wanted for, with, for them to do was give us the inputs for the process. And so we developed this input document. And we required them to fill this out prior to having a kickoff call with us basically put in those problems and solutions that they wanted to explore, uh, questions that they had around research, and hypotheses that they wanted to test. Believe it or not, this simple step saved us just countless hours of time that we would have otherwise spent with our clients hashing this all out with them on a call where we weren't even really necessary. They just needed to work all this stuff out themselves. Again, a lot of these things were just simple little things that we learned along the way 
But when we first started doing this and having kickoff calls, we were spending a lot of time talking through things. Once we put this in place, we were really spending a much shorter amount of time just finalizing. And the input doc worked really, really well. We were getting a majority of the way there to what we needed to design the research just from this information. And then, of course, our research team stepped back in and we reviewed and we helped uh, refine those problem statements and the questions for the research. And that was just another part of the learning for us was that it's important to provide some oversight as you're turning this, off, turning this over to a client, but also to actually establish up front that oversight was going to be a part of the process. We wanted to make sure we set those expectations up front so that everyone knew what to expect. Speaking of knowing what to expect, we also developed a project tracker. Um, before we did this, by the way, again, we were throwing ourselves into this, so we were just using emails back and forth and Slack channel and shared Google Docs. And that was working fine for a while, but we realized we needed to be much more coherent and clearly communicate what the process was to our stakeholders. I want to be clear, I'm not a huge fan of trackers. Like, we'd have to do a bazillion trackers for, you know, a bunch of different things, and so, uh, we didn't really want to have to do this, but the point was it wasn't actually for the research team. Uh, the tracker was actually for the client. It actually made the process a lot easier for them because it was transparent, uh, so they knew exactly what was coming up in the process. Um, it was also helped us with accountability. The color coding shows that there were some tasks that were uh, the research team's responsibility, um, some were the client's responsibility, some we had to work on together, and so this really kept everyone on track in terms of who was doing what. And then finally, I remember that one of the things we really wanted to do was make this a more repeatable process. And this actually helped us get there because we started to get a lot more consistent about exactly what we were building and exactly how the process was going to work. Okay, so great. At this point we're on, we've got everything we need to do the design work. And I have to be completely honest, it was our intention to turn over a lot of the design work to our stakeholders as well. And so we did that for the first few rounds. Um, as you might expect, we found that some of our stakeholders were better than others at not asking leading questions. Some of them were better than others at taking their own objectives and hypotheses and laddering them up into questions that we would ask consumers. And we coached them along the way, and we spent some time trying to get them up to speed on that. Eventually, we realized it was actually more efficient for us to just lead the design process with the inputs they had given us. So that meant actually building the questions from scratch based on the inputs that we had gotten in this input doc. Uh, again, we probably could have gotten there, and this may be my research pride, research ego, but we just found that we were better equipped at the part where we took what they were really trying to get at and asking that in a way that made sense to consumers. And so we had also felt like we were moving enough of the rest of the process off of our shoulders that this was something that we could go ahead and spend the time uh, on the research team and make sure that we had it done right the first time. It also ended up being a lot more efficient to do it right this way versus going in, having the client do it, and then spending time trying to make sense of what they had already come up with and refine it. This just ended up actually being a time saver for us. Okay, so at this point, we've got the design. We've used our user testing uh, tool to field the qualitative interviews, and we got the responses back. And again, to Capital One, I, I think it was a great idea that you guys um, pushed a lot of this type of qualitative analysis off to your stakeholders because we did as well. That was actually the biggest breakthrough for us in our qual research process, was assigning the work of doing the analysis of the qualitative interviews to our stakeholders. You all know, if you spend any time doing qual research, just how much time it takes to go through all of that. This actually worked really well for the team because they wanted to get in there any, anyway. It had an interesting side benefit that it helped. We used to get all these requests for to do 30 IDIs or 50 IDIs or 100 IDIs. And once uh, our stakeholders had to start watching the videos, they were very happy with the 10 to 12 that we were normally recommending for them. So that was not, I should have put that up there as an agile learning, but um, that was something that also worked really well for us. And we didn't push them out of the nest. We spent some time working with them in terms of what they should be listening for, how to take notes, how to make sure that they were, in, in, in fact, you know, leading to a conclusion that they were already looking for, uh, and then how to kind of sum, summarize across all the interviews. It wasn't a perfect process. Uh, as I've mentioned, Agile sometimes is not a perfect process, but it did get us an Agile approach to qual analysis. And once we worked with our clients on a couple projects, it actually got easier all around as we went on to the additional projects. 
So at this point, to bring it home, we just needed to turn those uh, detailed notes they had taken from their analysis uh, into a report. And then we also needed to do a final quality step with our research lens, just going through what they had come up with and make sure that we blessed it from a research perspective. Now again, we we're trying to get out of doing the work of uh, watching those interviews. So we were like, how are we gonna provide this research lens if we we're actually not watching any of the qualitative uh, interviews? And so what we did is we actually structured a one hour debrief call. And we basically moderated it like a brainstorming session. We had questions that we were used, we were using to ask our stakeholders to give us certain information that they had gleaned from their analysis. And then we actually used all of that to put together a top line report of the findings, usually just a one pager because again, we had so many ideas that we were going through, we really wanted to keep it pretty simple. And then the R&D team just added their product recommendation. So whether it was an idea that they were gonna pursue or whether they were gonna pivot it or kill it, and then they used that in their, uh, as an executive summary in their briefings with their executive management. And so that's really it in a nutshell, how we ended up putting that qualitative and earlier quantitative agile process together to work through this re request. So a few things that we got out of that. As I mentioned, we were successful in getting through that original backlog of ideas. Yes, we made a bit of a misstep, but not so much so that we didn't have information to help the team be able to move on to the next stage. And again, we did it within the client's time frame, which in this case actually happened to be the most important part of the process for them. We also got this uh, response time or turnaround time for qualitative projects down from what we were normally spending five days at a minimum, usually more, down to a 48 hour turnaround time. Now before we developed and implemented this process, you know, again, it would have taken us just so much longer to do that. Um, and in large part, that was due to just the resourcing constraints on our team. We simply couldn't get them started fast enough because there were only so many of us to go around. But again, we really increased our ability to get these done by making our clients uh, our co-researchers. And really importantly, we did create a process that was repeatable. And all of the input doc and the tracker, um, the analysis template that we used, all of that was a really large part of that. It really helped us uh, be able to get ideas in front of consumers and stakeholder uh, and results in front of our stakeholders much more quickly. Now that's the benefits that we got for that particular project, but you know, longer term, there were a couple other things that we got out of this. And one was, yes, that ability to have more time for doing strategic research. It was something that we were worried about, that taking on a project like this was gonna really make it difficult for us to spend time on bigger, larger things that really mattered to the organization. When we went to this process, it really helped us actually recoup some of that time so that we could be more proactive with our clients and understanding their learning agendas, what they were trying to achieve for their products, and how we could help them accelerate their objectives. And in the long run, that actually really led to us having much stronger relationships with our clients. Again, I've been very candid. When we went into this process, we had some real anxiety about implementing Agile Qual and pushing back some of those research tasks on our internal clients. Um, we were worried that we were gonna drive them away, uh, that they would come to the conclusion that A, they could do all of this without us, so why did they need us? Or B, that they were gonna find the process so painful and so onerous that, again, they would just say, screw it, I'm not gonna do research, I'm just gonna go with my gut. But in fact, the opposite thing happened. Uh, our stakeholders actually on this project started coming to us more earlier in the process with bigger questions um, and broader initiatives. Um, what's interesting is that you know they didn't really feel like they were off on their own. They actually felt more invested in the process. And again, we've heard that previously, it's a really great benefit of actually getting them more involved. They also didn't feel like research was as much of a black box as they had before we did this. They actually had a new appreciation for how much time and attention went into pulling off these kind of projects. So again, our biggest goal is that we really want to be partners for our teams, and we were really um, happily surprised to find that uh, doing more qual approach, uh, agile approach to qual really helped us get there. And so that's really it for me. Um, I'll just leave you with this. Uh, find your inner the qual. Sorry, there's just too many cute dogs jumping over fences out there. Uh, Denise, thank you.